it is time. It is time for the monthly wrap-up of the month of July. Can you believe July's already over? Because I cannot. And that's stressing me out. It's bringing me earnest, genuine distress. The fact that it's August the 1st today. Isn't that awful? <laughs> I'm genuinely stressed out over that. Nonetheless, hello. My name is Dakota and I read and write a lot and watch a lot of films. I consume a lot of media and art and so forth. And every month I do a wrap-up of all the books and films etc that I watched and read and this is July's. Lo and behold, I've had too much coffee. I'm so sorry. I can't control it. <laughs> July was an interesting month for reading and watching. I, own, I went to the Mubi Film Festival. I was invited to the Mubi, Mubi Film Festival. I cannot speak today. I was invited to the Mubi Film Festival with Mubi. Uh, in Manchester at the beginning of the month and so the only the only films I watched this month was via that film festival and via another press screening because I don't know I've been really busy this month um, with various things which are completely irrelevant to this video. Books wise, how many books did I read? I read one, two, three, four, five, six books this month. Six and a half but you know we can't count halves because that will have to go into the next month but I think without further ado, we should just go straight into it, don't you? In chronological order, always chronological order, because I get stressed out if it's not chronological order. Uh, we started off, so I got sent, I came back from, I was in Sicily for a month in June. I was in Sicily for the entire month, got back on July the 1st, and so I came back to some packages, books, that kind of thing, and I got sent these two books from Orion Carlotto, Carlotto, Carlotto. Uh, there's Flux and Film for Her, and I have seen these floating around. They're very picturesque books. I've seen them on on the apps and so forth. Uh, so I came home to a little package of these at my doorstep. And because they're both poetry, you know, naturally I got home, I hadn't read in a little bit because I was in Sicily. So I, di I dove straight into them. And I read them both in the same day in one sitting, which is not the best method to read poetry, but you know, it's the method that I went with. And so I started with this one. And I think this was her older one. It's, it was in it's 2017. Okay, 2017. So I think, I, I don't know how old she is, but I'm pretty sure she's young. And I think I need, you know, as someone else who published poetry considerably young, you have to give somebody grace when they publish their first book of poetry when they're young before their frontal lobe is developed. And in 2017 specifically, so the, the gift is it isn't a bad book of poetry. You can just tell that this was published in 2017 by somebody young who was lucky enough to fulfill their passions. You can tell it's from the, the Rupi Kaur era when everything was wonderful and exciting and new and big in the poetry world and you could everything was very relatable and had a big chance of virality. And then it was really interesting as well to go from this published in 2017 to... Where do I put this? This published in... Bear with me. 2020, and see the improvement into the development of the self. That's always a special thing to witness when people publish more than one book, specifically poetry collections. This also had some gorgeous visual counterparts, and it's also just a beautiful book in general. You know, I don't usually like hardcovers, but this is a good example of a hardcover that's done very well. Uh, this is, again, poetry, and it's very Americana, very Lana Del Rey Americana style. I got, they got me thinking about the kind of the romanticization of American rural life in Americana and the difference between that because I'm used to Australiana which is very different the romanticization of it um you know I, I can't relate I've never been to the US of A fun fact about me I've never been I have no idea what it's like I mean I've watched films I've read books I've listened to songs and my idea of it is a very romanticized Americana and that's very much the energy that I get in these books all the various various happenings in Americana and it's kind of like reading reading Joan Didion. If you haven't been to LA or America in general, you're not gonna get <laughs> one third of the book because you, it's just very specific to the place. You know, I feel like America is this echo chamber and if you're in there and you know everything, it sounds so wonderful, and incredible, but if you're not in there, you have no idea what's happening. Uh, so I felt very lost. <laughs> but it got me thinking, I'm back on track, about how the, uh, the romanticization is so it's such a polarizing contrast, a juxtaposition, if you will, to Australiana rural life. Because you know, Americana rural life seems to be very, very Lana Del Rey, very, uh, very you know, 
um, cowboy boots and guns and uh, Bonnie and Clyde and that kind of thing versus Australia on a rural life. If somebody hears you're from the from a tiny little town, specifically the town that I grew up in in Australia, the first thing people say is, "Oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> and you know, my first poetry book is also about my my Australiana, my feral Australiana countryside experience, and so. I completely relate to the prospect of wanting to write about place and the place that you're from and the place you're drawn to and that kind of thing. It's just such an interesting contrast because I feel like rural Australia is very feral and angry and dry and harsh and will kill you versus rural America. I know rural is probably not the right word, but it's a word that I'm using. <laughs> uh, it seems so, you know, whilst it can be harsh and everything, it seems so like, yeah, but that's how we like it. That's living, baby. <laughs> anyway, that just got me thinking. This is not part of the review in any way, shape, or form. Next up, I read the Shakespeare and Company book of interviews, introduced by Sylvia Whitman, edited by Adam Biles, and it's got interviews from Annie Erno, uh, Rachel Cusk, two people I love very much, but also uh, who was it? Oh my goodness, what's her name? Olivia Lang, who wrote The Lonely City and other books. And The Lonely City I read at the beginning of the year slash the end of last year, I can't remember, but it was the crossover point. And it really shaped my year in its entirety. So I wanted to listen to her and what she had to say about it. Also listen to Annie Erno, Rachel Cusk, other literary idols of mine. If you don't know, Shakespeare & Co is a bookstore in Paris. I think there's one in Vienna as well. And it's just very wonderfully curated. It's very famous, it's very old, it's very beautiful. And they have a lot of really cool events there. And there's a lot of history surrounding some classic writers that would frequent the place and thus I wanted to read this. And I mean, I, I won't lie, I skipped some of the interviews with people that I had absolutely no idea about. I tried to read them but they're talking about their book and I haven't read the book so it just <laughs> wasn't of much value to me. But the interviews that I did read were very insightful. It was a very quick read as well because it is just interviews. So I do recommend this if you like to hear an author talk more about their works and the insight to their process. The next book that I read is, if you've been around on this channel for a bit recently, you'll, you'll know that I'm obsessing with over Jeanette Winterson. This, I read Art and Lies, and this is one of the best books I read this year, by far. This book, I've had a great reading year, FYI, so that's a really high challenge list. And you know what, Jean Winterson is like the top three, I think, but <laughs> this is such an incredible book. I read this out in one of my previous videos, just the blurb, and I think I saw a lot of comments saying, I'm going to get that book now. Even more incentive now, do it. Art and Lies, Jeanette Winterson, so unique, so wonderful. It's set in a near future London. Sappho, Picasso, and Handel each set upon the same plan to flee the city by train. Finding themselves fellow passengers, the poet, the painter, and the musician discover their fates drawn together by the curious agency of a book. Basically, it's this kind of three separate lives smushed together into this one narrative with separate narratives. Uh, and it's quite surreal, quite dark, quite cerebral. There's parts that are absolutely beautiful. The passages, the chapters from that focus on Sappho's character are absolutely gorgeous. So beautiful, so stunning, breathtaking, brilliant, wonderful, sad, awful, written like pure poetry. The chapters by Handel, awfully weird, really weird, really uncomfortable, quite morbid, quite grotesque, quite sad, quite brilliant. And the chapters from, from Picasso start off quite obscure and then gets really dark and sad really quickly but Jeanette Winterson is just so wonderful she's a master of language she can manipulate you into feeling exactly how she wants you to feel this is a twisted book it's very dark and there's a lot of content warnings in this but it's one of the more unique books I've ever read and I cannot recommend it enough it's evangelical redemptive it's all about love beauty and language and I'm a sucker for language so this is my recommendation. <laughs> I think that might be my favorite book that I read out of all the books. I then read Art, Prairie Dresses, Art and Other from Danielle Dutton. And I think I've read the blurb in another one of my videos. It's like a little haul. And I was very intrigued by this because I picked this up having absolutely, is it focused on me? Okay. Is it focused on me? Sorry. I picked this up having absolutely no idea what it was about. I just liked the title. I feel like it's not focused on me.
the title drew me in and I had no idea about anything. I just really liked the cover and the title. And it was in the recommendations table at Hay Festival and I'm always gonna trust a Hay Festival recommendation. This is a very surreal experimental model of literature. I think I recommended this in a previous video. I can't even remember what I recommend anymore. I just, all I talk about is books. <laughs> so now it's all flying over my head. I don't know what I've read you anymore. Uh, so this is a cycle of surreal stories set in the quickly disappearing prairie land of the American Midwest, replete with wildflowers, ominous rivers, fireflies, cattle lowing, and ghostly apparitions. Dresses paints a wild and moving portrait of literary fashions. Art is an imaginative illustrated essay which explores the relationship between fiction and visual art and other focuses on an assemblage, assemblage of irregular stories and essays that are hilarious or heartbreaking by turns. So this is kind of in four parts. Prairie dresses art and other, you may have gathered. And they're all very different. There's short stories, there's essays, some of it's terrifying, some of it's genius, some of it's beautiful. It's another homage to language, I feel. I do have a type, very specific type. Brunette in a suit. Homage to language, I mean. <laughs> it was really unique, not like anything else I've read, very experimental. If you can hunt it down, because I got it at a very niche bookstore, so I don't know if it's niche or not. If it's not, if it is, either way, find it. Final book that I read is Surrealist Love Poems, edited by Marianne Kors, so compiled by her. But it's got a bunch of authors such as Andre Breton, Frida Kahlo, Louis Aragon, Louise Aragon, I don't know, I don't know. Marianne Kors wrote a really incredible introduction as well. I'm going to sneeze. Mary Ann Cause wrote a really incredible introduction about the connection between love, poetry, surrealism, surrealism and poetry, love and poetry, and you know, this holy trinity kind of situation. And it was really special. It gave a little bit of a background on surrealism, a little bit of a background on poetry, a bit of a background on love. How do you have a background on love? I don't know, but she did it. <laughs> Relatively, of course. And this was a beautifully curated collection. I've got a whole entire video on this. So I posted quite recently, a few days ago now, where I just read you my favourite poems from the book. And if that doesn't sell you on finding a collection of surrealist love poetry, I don't know what will. I'm really into surrealism at the moment, as you may have noticed based on a recent prompt for my literary and arts channel. Before we jump into films, I think this is a perfect example to talk about today's wonderful and always relevant sponsor, Squarespace. I'm gonna do the bit where I call them in. Beep beep, ring ring. Hello, <laughs> Squarespace. <laughs> I've worked with Squarespace many times before and I adore Squarespace because it is a platform that makes the whole process of creating and maintaining websites so seamless and dare I say enjoyable. I say this from personal experience because I wanted to give back to my community who support my creative endeavors. So I built an online literary and arts journal slash lovely little arts community via Squarespace. You can submit your poetry, fiction, art, and essays to me based on the monthly prompts, and I just might publish your work. Squarespace is so great for turning passion projects into professional projects and morphing dreams and concepts into tangible realities. This is done simply via the Fluid Engine Design System and Squarespace Blueprint, which is a guided design system to assist you in crafting a completely personalized website. There's elements I'm excited to eventually incorporate, like an online store with flexible payments. It's all so fun and easy to design, and you can so easily set up your own site too. Head to squarespace.com slash Dakota Warren to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code Dakota Warren. Let's talk about film. So as I said, I've watched four films this month in July, last month. Oh, the passage of time. It's going to stress me out again. The first film that I watched was on the 5th of July, and that was Maxine. That was... Ooh, that's weird. Somebody commented on my review with a bunch of symbols that just scared me. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? I got a brand new iPhone, by the way, because I dropped my last iPhone in the toilet. Really sad. And you know what the worst part was? I don't care if this is oversharing on the internet, because I don't ever share about anything else. <laughs> I, I dropped my phone in the toilet and obviously I, I sanitized it and after I dried it off I had to re-wet it because I had to sanitize it vividly, vividly, viscerally, uh, voraciously, 
voraciously, I don't know, but there's a V word that could fit really well here. But I had to sanitize it very much so, and very much so perhaps, maybe that's it. And so I had to re it, and basically the speakers were kaput, uh, you couldn't hear anything. I was on FaceTime with my friend when the phone fell into the toilet, and he said that afterwards it was just buzzing, and I was cackling and he could just hear buzzing. I need to stop giving anecdotes when I'm talking about books, anyway. Uh, and then I was, after I sanitized it and soaked it in rice and everything, I was willing to use it again. And then my friends bullied me. <laughs> yeah, they found out, well, they didn't find out, I told them blatantly that I dropped my phone in the toilet. And then they said, you can't use that, you can't use that, you can't use a phone with no speakers and you can't use a phone that's been in the toilet bowl. And I'm, but it's clean! No, you can't use that. So I bought a brand new iPhone. Also, to be fair, it was an iPhone 11. And this is the iPhone 15 Pro, and as a content creator, my pictures were such awful quality. Oh, I'm sad about it though, because I'm sentimental. Anyway, brand new iPhone. First film I watched in July was Maxine. Ma Maxine with three X's in the middle. This is uh, directed by T West. And we got to go to, I was invited to a screening of this, a premiere screening thing, and uh, T West was there and did an introduction and chatted about it a bit. And I had really high hopes for this, because I loved Pearl and the other one. I love, I think Mia Goth is wonderful, I think this character is brilliant. I think it's got so much, uh, it's so promising as a character, as a, as, a, as a trilogy, it's so promising. But I was so let down by this film. If you don't know, this uh, Mia Goth plays this character who's this uh, Midwest killer kind of girl uh, who comes from this tumultuous past and then just turns super evil and you know, this whole thing. And it's really fun because she's a very, she's, a, she's an it girl killer, you know, she's very relatable. She just wants to, she just wants to have fun. Let her, let her have fun, let her kill a few people. But this, this, this film to end the trilogy just felt rushed. It felt like it was a first script that was written. My friend and I were sitting in the, the screening and I had one glass of wine and I turned to her and I asked her, am I drunk? Because I don't understand anything that's happening. I was not drunk, it was just, I just didn't get it. And it's unfortunately my review seems to be the most common one. Just, you know, I wanted to like it, but I just couldn't understand it. It felt rushed and I didn't, yeah, I don't really know. Anyway, the next film that I watched is, so the next three films, the final three films, were at Mubi Film Festival in Manchester. So this was a gorgeous curation selected for us to watch, the, the people they brought along, of some gorgeous foreign films and just new and upcoming films. The first film that I watched is, which is my absolute favourite of the three, and I cried like a little baby in the film. Crossing, 2024, directed by Levan Akin. So this old woman from Georgia, she hears, she's looking for her long lost niece called Tekla, and her niece is a trans girl, and so Tekla's run to Turkey to be in this community where she's more accepted. and. But, you know, by running to this community where she's more accepted, she's exposed to the, the slings and arrows of life, such as drugs and uh, the sex work industry to make money when you're not accepted elsewhere and that kind of thing. And this this aunt, Leah, she's, she wants to find her desperately and she wants to, you know, she feels, she feels this awful sense of guilt that her mother's, who's now dead, has rejected her and she wants to make it right and so she goes and tries to find her and it's a beautiful story. It warmed my heart and it's all about humanity and it's just, the acting was incredible and it's also such a glimpse of culture, of Georgian culture and Turkish culture. It was just, there was just points where they're walking down the street and there was children singing the songs and it just, it just felt so lovely and special and raw and incredible and this director's brilliant. We got to watch several panels with him afterwards and his so to the point, so forthright, so direct, knows exactly what he wants to say and what he wants to convey. And he does, brilliantly. I really recommend this film very much. It is my favourite film that I watched out of every film this month. And I think it's one of my favourites of the year. The next film that I watched was Gasoline Rainbow um, in, from 2023 by the Turner, Turner Ross and Bill Ross, the Ross brothers. They're two American guys that we partied with. <laughs> Because it was a film festival, we just ended up partying with everyone, and then you know you get drunk and shouting, and you oh you're the you you directed that film I seen tomorrow, cool, so cool, lovely people. Uh, this was a gorgeous homage to youth and community. It's about five teenagers from a small town in Oregon. Oregon, everything's American. I don't know where Oregon is. 
<laughs> it's just these four teenagers who just it's just about a road trip basically to the end of the world which is a party on the beach and it sounds quite simple and it is quite simple but it's really lovely because it is just about these kids who have all come from pretty tumultuous pasts and uh, underprivileged communities finding each other and finding friendship in each other and growth and solace and it's really special it is really really special you know there were parts that made me laugh parts that made me tear up because these kids are so damn wise as well I say these kids like I'm not a kid anymore because I'm not a kid anymore, isn't it? I hate that I just had to go through that in real time with you, that realization. <laughs> I don't know. I feel so old and young all the time, all at once. Gorgeous film, very experimental, not like much I've seen. Again, I tend to watch experimental cinema and read experimental books, so I'm going to recommend experimental cinema and books. Thus, therefore. <laughs> the next film that I watched was called In Camera from 2023 by Nakash Khalid and this was uh, the final film that we watched and so I must say as well my, my attention span by that point was probably less to give this a fair rating and you know I, I went in I went in super excited and eager and open-minded with full attention and by the last film I didn't have much left <laughs> and so I keep in mind my review of that is probably going to be inherently affected by my energy or lack thereof so in camera is about a young man who spends most of his time recording self-tapes for parts as an actor and he receives multiple rejections and it takes a toll and he kind of goes a bit mad and he is kind of a bit mad and is this really interesting character who just doesn't really feel anything and it's like watching an alien and watching the director talk about this as well was like watching an, he's, he's, kind, he's kind of describing an alien and I didn't really think it was necessarily meant to be this sci-fi kind of dystopian film but it felt like that. I really really wanted to love it because the director was so likeable and so humble and so excitable but I just think it was one that I couldn't gel with as much. It's also just my my general genre of film that I enjoy. Uh, it was very very boyish. Does that make sense? It was very boyish. Perfect timing for finishing this video because my camera's about to go flat. Also, I have to go meet my friends now. I always film just before meeting my friends and that's because I, I only ever get dressed like in nice clothes and wear makeup when I'm going out to see friends. On my days off that I'm working, I will never, I'll wear a nightgown and no makeup. And I can't film on those days because it's inherently less presentable. <laughs> and so I'm always rushing to film a whole video or three whole videos right before I'm going to see friends and my phone's vibrating saying, Dakota, Dakota, where are you? And I'm just chatting to my camera about books. <laughs> it was lovely to see you. Very lovely to see you. It always is. And I will see you next time. There's going to be more videos in between the wrap up of next month, but who knows what they'll be. <laughs> Comment your favourite watches and reads from this month as well. I'm always looking for recommendations and I'm sure so are everyone else. So is everyone else in the comments. Incredible grammar. <laughs> I love you. <laughs>